Gopi Janaba Laba Kirbare Dari Kisora Nandana Braja Janaranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Tunjabi Hari Gopi Janabalaba Eated by the Tari Yasodanandana Raja Janaranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Om Agyana Chimadandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshun Militang Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasavi Gobhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We'll introduce today's question and answer session with, as some of you may have heard on Thursday, Pritchett Maharaj asking a very important question to Shukadeva Goswami after Pritchett Maharaj heard about 
the killing of Agasura. We should keep in mind what the Acharyas mentioned about Pritchard Maharaj again and again whenever he asked questions. We should know that Pritchard Maharaj's heart is controlled by hearing the pastimes of Krishna. And he's also feeling separation. He's absorbed in praying and feeling separation from Krishna. He knows that questions and answers, topics about Krishna are the only medicine for the conditioned soul, as well as the liberated soul who's suffering from separation from Krishna. And of course that suffering is not material. It seems that some details about the Agasura incident were not clear. And so Richard Maharaj is going to ask questions, knowing that the answers would be most auspicious for everyone. So he asks, and we'll hear, Sri Rajovacha, Brahman Kalantara Kritang, Tat Kalinam Katam Bavet, Yat Komare Hari Kritam, Jagu Pau Gun Dekare. Bakaha. Maharaj Preachit inquired, O oh, great sage, how could things done in the past have been described as being done at the present? Lord Sri Krishna performed this pastime of killing Agasura during his Komara age. How then, during his Palganda age, could the boys have described this incident? as having happened recently. So I hope you remember that Krishna's Komar age is between one and five, and Palganda is between six and 10. So this killing of Agasura happened at the end of Krishna's Komar age. But the cowherd boys never talked about it until a year later, when they were at the beginning of the Pogunda age. So therefore, Pritchard Maharaj is wondering what's going on here. The cowherd boys were entering Vrindavan, singing about Krishna's killing of Agasura, the serpent, even though this happened a year ago. So Pritchard Maharaj, is thinking there must have been some special energy at work. And he mentions this to Shukadeva Goswami. Tadbruhi me maha yogin param gautu halam guru nunam eta dere eva maya bhavati nanyata. O greatest yogi, my spiritual master. Kindly describe why this happened. Why the gap, in other words, in time. I'm very much curious to know about it. I think it was nothing but another illusion due to Krishna. So Pritchard Maharaj is intelligently calculating that some act of Krishna's potency must have been involved. So he's curious. Now he knows it can't be Maya Shakti, the illusory energy, because these are the eternal associates of Krishna, the cowherd boys. They can't fall into Mahamaya. So there must be some internal potency, some very special spiritual potency at work that has caused apparently such bewilderment that the cowherd boys are marching from the forest 
back to Vrindavan, talking about the slaying of Agasura, which actually happened a year ago, but they're talking about it like it just happened today. So Pritchett Maharaj is trying to guess the truth, what's going on here. <laughs> And he presents his question to Shukadeva Goswami in such a submissive, humble way. He says, Vayam dan yatama loke garopi chatra bandavaha. Vayam pibamo muhus tata punyam krishna katam ritam. Oh, my Lord, my spiritual master, although we are the lowest of chatriyas, we are glorified and benefited because we have the opportunity of always hearing from you the nectar of the pious activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So why did Pritchett Maharaj, when making his question, consider himself, address himself as the lowest of Chatriyas, Chatra Bandava. He's not faking humility. He's feeling devotional submission, devotional humility. And also he's remembering, I was the one who wrapped the dead snake around the neck of a Brahmana. So he's calling on Shukadeva Goswami in a very humble way. I'm your student. And if the student presents himself to the guru submissively, and the student's inquiring about some special topic, the guru will answer. Meanwhile, what's happening with Shukadeva Goswami? This happens from time to time. Hearing about Krishna, questions about Krishna, Shukadeva Goswami lost contact with his senses and he had to be revived. His external sensory perception had to be revived before he could speak the answers. And how? Was his external sense perception revived? In the audience was Narada Muni, Vyas, and others. And there was also Pritchett Maharaj's son, Janamejaya. And Pritchett Maharaj had his son keep instruments like drums, <laughs> cartels, knowing that from time to time, Shukadeva Goswami would go into ecstasy and lose contact with the external world. So with cartels, conches, and drums, <laughs> and the chanting of Narada, Muni, Vyas, and others, they brought Shukadeva Goswami back to the external world. <laughs> they were prepared. They know. This is the power of Krishna Kata. Shukadeva Goswami can just lose contact with the ordinary world. And upon coming to his external consciousness, Shukadeva Goswami congratulates Pritchett Maharaj. And you'll see this throughout Srimad Bhagavatam. The questioner congratulating the one who's to answer the questions and the one who's to answer the questions congratulates the questioner. So, Sri Shuka Uvacha, Sadhu Prishtam Mahabhaga, Taya Bhagavatot Tama, Yannutan Nayashishyasya, Shinvanapi Katamahu. Srila Shukadev Goswami said, O oh, best of the devotees, most fortunate Bridget, 
you have inquired very nicely. For although constantly hearing the pastimes of the Lord, you are perceiving his activities to be newer and newer. So Srila Prabhupada points out that this is the symptom of actual spiritual advancement. That although someone's continually hearing about Krishna's pastimes for many years, still those topics come to them, come to that person, that hearer, as newer and fresher. And therefore, such devotees can never give up hearing the pastimes of Lord Krishna, although they've, from one point of view, heard them again and again, but from another point of view, those pastimes are ever fresh and you haven't heard them before. That's how you experience them, newer and fresher at every moment. So Pritchett Maharaj is referred to as Bhagavatottama, the best of the devotees, because of that symptom feeling ecstasy, hearing topics that someone else would say, you heard it so many times, you read it so many times. But to preach it, because of his spiritual advancement, the topics appear, indeed, as they are, ever fresh, ever new, because these topics are the spiritual world, not subject to time and space. So let us hear if you have any questions. All right, the first one I see is Gokul Leela. Um, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Um, the, the question is, um, you mentioned about how Parikshit Maharaj asked the question with great humility and, um, and also the, the symptoms of humility when, when we read the pastimes, we hear the pastimes, we, we feel like the ever fresh and then what happens if if i catch myself with this thought that all these these pastimes are getting you know like fresh and uh, it feels like i never read them before or the the pastimes um, appear very new but then the mind um thinks uh this is a very humble thought and then i become proud of kind of being humble so how can i how can I cultivate humility without um, becoming proud? Like catching myself with this uh, humble thoughts. We're grateful that we can begin to hear Krishna's pastimes as ever fresh. Just a glimpse of that makes us so grateful. At the same time, we know we have so far to go. <laughs> so it's great to have started the journey, but... <laughs> There won't be an end to this journey because you'll go deeper and deeper and deeper into the realities, the unlimited realities of Krishna's pastimes. So yes, there should be gratitude. At the same time, we should feel that if only I were more Krishna conscious, I could go much farther. So in that way, we don't become complacent. We're pushing ahead, always in the quest for pure love. Okay, I'm just calling out the names that are on the Zoom. So that, I don't know who those names might correspond to all the time, but I see Julian. Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj. <clears throat> uh, I had a question um, in the CC. Um, Prabhupada explains in one of the purports um, that uh, Sri 
Shumati Radharani expands herself in multivarious forms as the goddesses of fortune, uh, the queens and the damsels of Raja. So I was wondering, uh, with the the gopis, are they are they ever jivas? Because it seems like they are only ever internal potency. <clears throat> they can be both. They can be shakti tattva and jiva tattva. Technical question. <laughs> Spiritual engineering question. <laughs> 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 okay, there you have your answer. Thank you. <laughs> Esther. Hi, Krishna Guru Dev. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask a question that relates to um, Bhagavad Gita chapter, teen, chapter 18, text 5. Um, in this chapter, Srila Prabhupada makes reference to acts of penance. And I've recently heard in a lecture um, online that a devotee must be uh, penanceful in their in their pra practice of bhakti. And I just wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about that point and the meaning of penance in this context in chapter 18. Thank you. Always chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only medicine in this day and age. Chant Hare Krishna and induce others to chant Hare Krishna. That's your penance, and don't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I see the name Sweta Lal. Hare Krishna Gurudev. Uh, Gurudev, I wanted to ask a question about uh, what we can do about other devotees and non-devotees. Like what I see, is that we are very affluent in the sense that we have so much of moral, mental, and physical support in terms of the congregation we have here in Melbourne. But uh, when when I look back in India and with my friends and relatives, uh, they are struggling a lot. Uh, I mean, there, there are some friends whom I don't know even now. I'll be able, I will be able to talk to them the next time I call them. Will they be there or not? So, what can we do for them? From uh, like, can we chant for them or can we? Uh, what can, what else can we do for them? Whatever opportunity you have, you can try to induce them in bhakti to take up the chanting of Hare Krishna. Whatever opportunity arises. Your question leads to a popular concern these days about the state of the world. I'd like to point out that in case you haven't noticed, the state of the world has always been precarious and danger laden, but sometimes we're aware of it and sometimes not, according to the part of the globe that you reside. Some parts of the world have the illusion that everything has been nice for quite some time, whereas other parts of the world have experienced total havoc and people are desperate so it just depends on where you are and the time some parts of the world that are so-called undisturbed now you wouldn't have want you wouldn't have wanted to live in those places 40 or 50 years ago so things change <laughs> Yet we are so quick to be um, complacent. We want everything to be nice in the material world. And it's not going to happen. You get these interludes of severe distress or peace and contentment. This is, remember, you've got to understand your geographical location. And Google, if Google Maps is not helping you to do this particular <laughs> understanding. You're in the middle planetary system, by the way. That means mixed happiness and distress. Sometimes things become acutely distressful. 
Sometimes things seem to be acutely happy, and then there's always to and fro, according to various degrees and shades. The heavenly planets are relatively always materially happy, and the lower planets are relatively always distressful, but you're in the middle. Now, bear in mind, you've just heard, some of you at least, the pastime of Agasura's being killed by Krishna. Agasura was such a ferocious Asura demon that even the demigods were in fear. So Prabhupada points out that even in the heavenly planets, in the upper planetary system, there are problems because it's the material world. Even Indra gets attacked. <laughs> even Lord Brahma becomes perplexed. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> so Agasura had affected even Lord Brahma. <laughs> what to speak of our being perplexed what's happening in the world oh no which crisis is going to hit and when those of you in New Zealand of which your prime minister refers to as the shaky isles are so quick to forget about earthquakes. The Kiwis take it as normal when the ground shakes. Everyone else is terrified. <laughs> so the Kiwis are wondering, oh, what's happening in the world? Will there be an economic collapse? Will there be war? Will there be this? Will there be that? But when the ground shakes, oh, another tremor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember being in Wellington, taking a shower, soaked with a wet gumshon, and all of a sudden the building starts to sway. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. Should I run out in the street and, you know, soaking wet with just a gumshon? <laughs> but uh, New Zealanders take it as a day in the life, another day, another tremor. And they figure occasionally there'll be a moderate earthquake, like what happened twice in Christchurch. But uh, life goes on. Whereas everyone else is just terrified of earthquakes. <laughs> so it's all relative. And yes, on every part of the globe, on this earth planet from time to time, disturbances become more acute. than in other parts of the globe. So where is the peace? That's the question we should ask ourselves. We have manufactured a concept that the material world will be relatively peaceful and relatively free from anxiety. And it's not gonna happen. <laughs> the bad karma comes this way, comes that way. Some places get it in terms of economic desperation. Others get it in terms of earthquakes. Others get it in terms of military conflict. And you become accustomed so easily to whatever is predominant in your locale. So you can actually get used to constant military conflict, government oppression. You can get used to that. I tried to serve Krishna on every have a little continent of this world. So I've seen. Here in New Zealand, we think nothing of tsunami warnings, cyclone warnings, or when the ground shakes, as I already described. 
<laughs> Others think this is hellish. <laughs> and we forget the North Island, South Island geologically were formed by volcano eruptions. <laughs> and the whole country is sitting on tectonic plates, a junction where they grind together. But no, we want everything to be peaceful. But you'll get the bad karma. When I say you, I'm talking about uh, those who are caught up in the illusory energy. You'll get the bad karma one way or another. You can't kill so many cows and expect to get away scot-free. You may not get the disturbance that other places in the world get, but there will be disturbance. The only solution is to help people get out of the turbulent ocean of karmic activity. And we're always looking for an opportunity to do that. So remember, even Lord Brahma becomes perplexed as you read in the Agasra Leela. Even Lord Brahma is wondering, what's going on? <laughs> and Agasra, when he opened his mouth and the cowherd boys marched in, the demigods panicked. They always had been thinking, when will this demon be killed? They were in anxiety. And that's the heavenly planets. <laughs> so what do you expect you're going to feel in the material world on Earth? Oh, the economy, will it collapse? What will happen to the political system? <laughs> Who will be the controllers of the government? <laughs> are we really free or are we not? <laughs> it's all part of material life. But sometimes you notice it and sometimes you forget about it. Because the material atmosphere means forgetfulness due to the covering potency of Maya. Prakshe Patmika Shakti. As you probably know, Maya has two divisions Avaranatmika Shakti, the throwing potency, and Prakshe Patmika Shakti, the covering potency. So forgetfulness is always our companion in material existence. And we're determined to march on in material life. Just like when there's an earthquake somewhere and some city is partially destroyed, like Christchurch. Immediately everyone says, we will rebuild, we will rebuild. <laughs> Even in Melbourne a few weeks ago, there was a tremor. There was some damage in the center of the city, but ah, that was a freak event. Life moves on. <laughs> so one thing or another is always there in material life to give us anxiety. Best use these circumstances, any circumstances, negative or positive, to take more shelter of Krishna, and then you're victorious. Otherwise, there's no material victory. Adira Vaughn has her hand up. Hi, Krishna Gurumash. Thank you. I'm trying to understand um, how devotees have opinions and that they can be different from each other. Because um, I'm just trying to understand if the Krishna conscious position is to be neutral and free of personal bias and just see what's best for Krishna or how does a Christian conscious person have a different opinion from another Christian conscious person? We all agree, hopefully, that we should fulfill Krishna's desire in Bhagavad Gita to take shelter of him, always think of him. But because we're individuals, we may have different slants on that, how to serve Krishna best. But the agreement is how to serve Krishna. Mm different angles on the best way to serve Krishna. 
so yes, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, which has spanned the whole world, is variegated. And therefore, we have an assembly of senior devotees who, by consensus, push the way forward. But you cannot extinguish individuality. You sing a certain way. Not everyone sings that way. <laughs> you like certain things. Not everyone likes those things. But as devotees, we can all agree that Krishna should get the best. And we should try to serve Krishna in the best way. About material affairs, there'll always be variegatedness. Just like when it comes to devotees and their medical situation. I only go to an Ayurvedic doctor. I don't trust any other doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, <laughs> no, no. I only use pharmaceuticals. Uh, they've been vetted. They've been tested. Someone else. Oh, you don't know about big pharma. You don't know. <laughs> Someone else. You don't know about Ayurveda. <laughs> so on and on and on it goes. Prabhupada's response, just taking this medical situation as an example, his response was, whatever works. He wasn't falling for the purity of Ayurveda. He said most Ayurvedic doctors are cheaters. <laughs> and he wasn't embracing allopathic Western medicine as the all in all. He said Western medicine has advanced greatly in, in some ways. So he, he just said whatever works, whether it's Western, Eastern, Northern, or Southern, <laughs> Ayurvedic or not, whatever works. And just understand there is no material cure to birth, death, disease, and old age. So one way or another, we are going to <laughs> experience and so we're out of the material energy. We will experience birth, death, disease, and old age. So we have to learn how to live with material uncertainty. And I noticed that rattles a lot of devotees' cages. They want to know for sure, is it Ayurveda? That is the way. <laughs> or pharmaceuticals, that's got to be the way. <laughs> Is this corporate head a demon or is this corporate head an undercover devotee? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Devotees, I notice sometimes don't understand you're in the material world and there is always uncertainty and mixture on the material platform. You'll never find all good on the material platform. There'll always be some discrepancy. If you don't like it, get out of the material world. <laughs> don't take another material body. You'll never get to the end of the complications, the suspicion, the doubts, the uncertainty. That's why Shukadeva Goswami says, Kalea Dosha Nidhi Rajan. The age of Kali is an ocean of faults. You'll never get to the end of the faults. You'll never figure out completely what's going on. <laughs> but there's only one good thing in that ocean of faults, and that's chanting Hare Krishna. So uh, there'll always be this uncertainty, and I see that a lot of devotees can't handle that. They want to know for sure. Is there a global conspiracy or is there not? <laughs> is this the perfect health solution or is it not? <laughs> Everything's a mixture. <laughs> Just like 
I was speaking Thursday about Srinivas Acharya. He, Shamananda, and Narottam Das Thakur had been commissioned by Jiva Goswami to take copies of the Shastras, the Goswami books, from Vrindavan to Bengal via ox cart. And on the way, they were apprehended by some thieves. Word came to the king of that territory they were passing through that there was an ox cart laden with valuable treasures. So the king was actually a leader of gangsters. <laughs> and so he informed the gangsters what's happening. But he also, being kind of Vedic, he consulted an astrologer. Oh, <laughs> often our devotees like to try and find certainty from an astrologer. <laughs> Those of you who've consulted astrologers about your marriage partner know how bewildering it can be. <laughs> I see Katamrita giving a look to Sankarshan Ram. <laughs> You'll get different opinions from different astrologers. Finally, in desperation, you just choose the opinion that you want. He says it's going to work. We'll listen to that astrologer. We won't listen to the other ones. <laughs> because, you know, you're getting a bit desperate. You psychologically and physio physiologically feel crunch time is upon you. <laughs> <laughs> so you want certainty. <laughs> so 500 years ago or so, the astrologers were much more competent than now, even though it's the still age of Kali. So the astrologer told the king, yes, in the ox cart is the most precious treasure. Oh, so the king really got fired up. My spies have told me the truth. The astrologer has confirmed. So he told the robbers, tonight's the night. Go get it. And so being good Hindus, what did the robbers do before their attack? They prayed to Durga. <laughs> and then... They came at a time when Srinivas Acharya's party was asleep and the robbers praised Durga. Oh, this is all Durga Devi's mercy. They're all asleep. They've had their dinner. They're knocked out. So they confiscated the ox cart and brought it to the king who discovered the contents. These are just books. How could I have been misled by the astrologer? Where's the certainty? And the astrologer begged and pleaded. I did my calculations again and again. There's the most valuable treasure in that ox cart. I don't know what happened. But the astrologer was actually right. But the most valuable treasure wasn't jewels or gold. It was the Shastras. <laughs> so... When Naratam, Srinivas, and Shamananda woke up the next morning and saw the books were gone, they practically wanted to give up their life. But gradually, Srinivas started to get to the bottom of the situation, asking around, and people informed him, it's probably the king and his crew who have taken your books. Now, this king is a mixed character. And this is my point about certainty. The king liked to hear Srimad Bhagavatam, although he had such nefarious activities. <laughs> so, <laughs> Pinivas made a conspiracy <laughs> to cope with the king's conspiracy. He partnered with a Bhagavatam reciter who would often speak Bhagavatam for the pleasure of the king. And in that way, Srinivas 
got the attention, got to be known by the king. He's, oh, you're a Bhagavatam speaker too. Well, go ahead, speak Bhagavatam. Remember, this is the king who's the leader of the gangsters. <laughs> so is he all good or is he all bad? What's going on here? And Srinivas began to speak Bhagavatam and got the confidence of the king. And then one day popped the question to the king in private. Uh, I had some books and they were taken. Might you know something about that? And the king replied, um, uh, funny you would mention that. Uh, yeah, we got these books and I, mean, I don't quite know what to make of them. And uh, I'm ashamed to say that we took them thinking that in the cart were valuable jewels. So in that way, Srinivas got the books back and eventually the king became his initiated disciple. So here you see, <laughs> things, situations in this world are complex, but we like to make things neat and tidy and certain. But this material world is an ocean of anxiety and uncertainty. In case you haven't noticed. <laughs> so as devotees, we should be careful not to rush off in this direction or that direction, stampede over a cliff. <laughs> we should be moderate understanding that there'll always be things in this world you can never get to the bottom of, but we should try to understand Krishna. <laughs> and you'll never get to the bottom of understanding Krishna, but for another reason, that you're dealing with the spiritual energy. Whereas the material energy, you'll never get to the bottom of it because it's bewildering. That's why, guess what? That's why it's called Maya. <laughs> Remember. Okay. Sham Shamanga has his hand up. Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj. Lord Chaitanya says, everywhere you go, whoever you meet, teach the science of Krishna. But we also know that we should teach according to time and circumstance. My question is, when we're out and about in the world, how can we judge when is a good opportunity, say, to, to preach to someone, teach them the Hare Krishna mantra, give them the book, or is it always a good time to do that? Do something and you'll gradually learn a sense of timing, but you'll never learn that unless you do something. You've got to start somewhere, like a child taking it, its first steps. If you don't take those first steps, you'll, you'll never get anywhere. Or like learning how to ride a bicycle. You use those training wheels. <laughs> you got to start somewhere. Get into action, and Krishna will give you intelligence because it's Lord Chaitanya's order, and Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself. So the genuine guru takes that order through parampara and passes it down to someone who wants to be a genuine disciple. Wherever you go, whomever you meet, teach the science of Krishna. So have it in your heart to always think, how can I best serve Krishna in this situation? And you'll get intelligence. Sankrishan Ram. Hi, Krishna Gurudev. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, Lord Balram. As we know that Lord Balram is the first expansion of Krishna and everything he does uh, just to enhance the pleasure of Krishna. Uh, he manifests himself in everything, whatever Krishna, like his paraphernalia and everything. So my question is, uh, in uh, during, like in Mahabharat, why it appears that uh, Lord Balram is in the favor of uh, Kauravas, who happen to be on the side of a religion, Adharma, because being the supreme personality of God and Himself, 
why Lord Balram, and he also, Lord Balram is the original spiritual master as we, as we hear. So why being this original spiritual master, he is taking side of Adharma. He's not really taking the side. He just was known to be favorable to the other side. And he's Balaram, who especially becomes contradictory as Lord Nichananda. <laughs> Remember how Lord Nichananda kicked Shivananda saying, angry because he was hungry and Shivananda saying hadn't arranged his residence or his meal. <laughs> so before kicking Shivananda saying, Lord Nichananda had announced that I'm so hungry I could die. Therefore, I curse that the three sons of Shivananda Sain will die. <laughs> you can imagine what Shivananda Sain's wife thought when she heard that. Oh, my three boys, not one, not two, not three, but all three boys have been cursed to die. And so, she, of course, she was devastated, crying, and her husband finally came back after having made the arrangements for Nichananda's boarding for the night. Shivananda Sain came back and saw his wife in such a condition. And she told him what happened. Nichananda cursed our three sons to die because your arrangements for his residence and meal were late. What was Shivananda Sain's reply? May all our sons die be because of the inconvenience we've caused Nichananda Prabhu. And then Shivananda Singh went to see Nichananda, who immediately kicked him. <laughs> and Shivananda Singh was like, oh, the perfection of life. Dust from the lotus feet has touched me. Dust that even Lord Brahma could never attain. Now my family life is perfect. Now my religious principles are perfect. My economic affairs are perfect. I'm so satisfied. And now I'm free from material existence. <laughs> Seeing that reaction, Lord Nichananda embraced Shivananda saying. <laughs> so Balaram and Krishna have their differences, but Balaram's never disrupted Krishna's pastimes. He has an individuality. He wears blue and Krishna wears yellow. What about that? <laughs> Balaram is whitish, Krishna's bluish. So the spiritual world is full of variety, but all the varieties for Krishna's pleasure. Balaram didn't take sides in the battle of Kurukshetra. He left to go on pilgrimage. And remember when Krishna had disfigured Rukmi after defeating all of Rukmi's forces in battle. You know, the kidnapping of Rukmini and all of Rukmi's forces were wiped out and he dared to face Krishna alone. And Krishna, of course, defeated him thoroughly and then took his sword and started snipping at Rukmi's hair and mustache, drawing a little blood also, just making him look horrible and funny. <laughs> it was Balaram who chastised Krishna. Krishna, what are, you, what are you doing? This is not our family tradition. <laughs> You've made him look so strange. <laughs> so you can count the times. I forgot the number where Balaram went back and forth between Rukmini and Krishna, sometimes criticizing Krishna, sometimes criticizing Rukmini, back and forth. 
because Rukmini obviously wanted mercy for her brother, <laughs> who actually deserved to die, but she wanted mercy. And so Balaram was negotiating the whole situation. Krishna, you shouldn't have done this. Rukmini, you should know better about this. But Krishna, <laughs> back and forth it went. <laughs> this all adds flavor to the Leela. <laughs> so you can read it for yourself in the Krishna book. Uh, Leela Madhurya. Make it compact now. <laughs> I, I will try. Um, bef before uh, cowboys, they entered the Agasura, they were considering if it's uh, dangerous or not. And finally, they decide that uh, even it's dangerous, even it's a demon, so Krishna will protect them anyway. And <clears throat> since you explained that we are in, we are in ocean of anxiety, how to understand that I have done my best and then I just have to rely on Krishna or in certain situation, I may say, oh, I rely on Krishna and I'm just lazy. Where is this line? How I understand? We do our best to serve Krishna in any situation. And then you can say that the result is up to Krishna. But you have to do your best for Krishna's pleasure. You also have to be expert in seeing what part of the situation is coming from past karma. You get this vision by reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. Your vision changes. You get to see things differently. Just like I've often pointed out, householders have differing what they call money karma. Some householders, money comes to them very easily. Some just have enough to get by month to month. Some householders start out very economically prosperous. Some don't, and then it can reverse. I've seen it all the time. <laughs> Some families with resources, financial resources, like a ship that runs aground on the rocks, they, they lose it all. Other families start out with just enough to make it day to day and some other day, money comes to them. So one has to be expert to judge what's your karmic inheritance. And that's a little tricky for devotees because they're getting minimized karmic reactions if they're true to the path of bhakti. And also try to see what's Krishna's special arrangement. Just like Prabhupada said about himself. Astrologically, he was meant to be one of the richest men ever in India. But Krishna took things a different way. Krishna wanted him to come to the West penniless. So all these angles have to be there. You have to see the karmic angle. You see the special Krishna factor. In analyzing, have you done your best? And this takes spiritual intelligence. And that spiritual intelligence comes from the book Bhagavat and the person Bhagavat. Bhakti always requires guidance. And in this way, we can chart our path successfully through the material world. Madhurya Amrita. Hi, Krishna. Good day. Um, I was wondering, now that we've been in lockdown for a little bit here in, in Auckland. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> for a while. Um, I'm just trying to figure out I'm asking Krishna, but maybe also I want to ask you as well, how are we supposed to approach outreach 
are we supposed to start doing things online? That's what I'm, I'm trying. I don't know. Or what are we supposed to do to get, reach Whatever people? Whatever you can do, you do. Uh -huh. Some are using this time to rest their bodies and rejuvenate. That's also part of service to Krishna. So whatever you can do in terms of helping others, you do, but you also have to help yourself. It's a good time to load up on reading Shastra. It's a good time to focus more on your quality of chanting. It's a good time to get your physical energies together so that You'll be ready for action for whatever comes and who can say what will come. So in this way, use whatever phase for Krishna's pleasure. Gaya Maya. Hi, Krishna Gurudev. Um, my question was, uh, how can we develop more trust in Krishna that he will always look after us and protect us and so we can focus more, more on serving him rather than getting worried? That's why we need to bathe our intelligence daily in Srimad Bhagavatam. Otherwise, we're surrounded by such an ocean of anxiety, we could be affected, but Bhagavatam will protect our intelligence. But if we neglect our daily hearing and chanting, certainly we'll be affected by anxiety. Oh, what's going to happen now? Oh, no, this, this is happening. That's happening. This is supposed to happen. That is supposed to not happen. Oh, no. It'll go on and on and on. <laughs> is the world falling apart? Or is it the dawning of the age of Aquarius? <laughs> that was the big thing back in the 60s. You probably don't know about that diamond. <laughs> is it the dawning of the age of enlightenment uh, we are in the golden age of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu what does that mean amidst the deluge of Kali Yuga there's a facility of an umbrella for those who stay under the umbrella they're protected from the deluge that means their spiritual life's protected. The material body is doomed. Oh, we have a hard time accepting that. All right, you say, the material body's doomed. Let it be doomed 30 years from now, not tomorrow. But <laughs> from the intelligent point of view, whether today or 30 years from now, you're dealing with doom. So we need to keep our intelligence polished and sharp. Otherwise, we're sure to become frazzled and worried and anxiety-ridden and stressed out because we don't like our prospects for material contentment to be disturbed. We're really attached to our hopes and prospects for material contentment. And every once in a while, in the middle planetary system, situations come up that show your boat's going to be rocked. And we don't want our boats rocked. But we can use the present circumstances of uncertainty, which are always there, actually, to take more shelter of hearing and chanting about Krishna. Pritchard Maharaj is showing us the way. He's cursed to die in seven days, but his heart is controlled by hearing about Krishna's pastimes. I see the name Stumba Bhava with a hand up. Hare Krishna Guru Dev, it's Anadi Kishore Das from the Brahmacharya Ashram. Um, just wondering, it seems like being a 
perfectionist can often manifest itself as a weakness. Uh, sometimes we may do a service and it doesn't go the way we imagined. And then as a result of that, there's some mental disturbance. So I'm wondering how we can use the quality of being a perfectionist as a strength in bhakti rather than the, the reverse. What do you mean by being a perfectionist? <laughs> Give me an example. Uh, you, won't okay. find, you won't find perfection on the material platform. So I'm wondering what you mean. <laughs> okay, maybe we can rephrase that as just having high expect expectations of one own, one's own performance capacity. So Give me an I, example. I imagine I can uh, lead a kirtan in a certain way and it doesn't go the way I planned, or I imagine I can distribute- well, Kirtan is for the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So what does it mean that your kirtan doesn't go the way you planned? You're singing for the pleasure of Sri Krishna. You're not trying to impress everyone with musical professionalism. Can you hear this tune? Did you see how I <laughs> sung that? <laughs> So I think we need to remember that devotional service of which kirtan is a part. Devotional service is performed for Krishna's pleasure. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Ah. Sankarshan Ram, your hand is still up. Is there anyone else? <laughs> Oh, I see. I see Dinanath waving his hand at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> you have a question? Yes. I just see the top of your head. Now I see more of you. Okay. okay. I see your mother and father are with you. So what is your question? You always have a good question. Um, I wanted to ask, um, uh, Krishna is so famous, then why do people forget him? Krishna is so famous, you said? Mm -hmm. Why do people forget him? You've been thinking about that, huh? Mm -hmm. Very good. Do you discuss this with your parents? Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm glad you have such discussions. Yes. We were speaking the other day about Srinivas Acharya, as a little boy, he would discuss Krishna with his father and they both would break out into ecstasy. <laughs> so if Krishna is so famous, why do people forget him? Because of envy. They misuse their intelligence and their independence. And they have to have that option. They have to have that choice. In order to love Krishna, there has to be independence. So they become covered by Krishna's illusory energy, which means forgetfulness. This can only happen because of an, another energy of Krishna. The Living entities are one energy, Jiva Shakti, and then there is Maya Shakti, the illusory energy. When you misuse your independence, the Maya Shakti covers you over. But you have that choice to use your independence properly or to misuse it. So you can discuss more of this with your parents because it may seem a bit technical for you or you've got it all figured out. What do you say? And you've got it all figured out. <laughs> oh, okay. How old are you? Uh, six. Six and you got it all figured out. Krishna says, I be a sha gunamai, mama maya dharatya, ma me be a prapajante, maya me tam tarantite. This illusory energy of mine is practically impossible to overcome. But if you surrender to me, you can cross over this illusory energy by my grace. So that's what you should have figured out. Okay? 
So you discuss that with your father and mother. <laughs> How to take more shelter of Krishna so that you'll never forget Krishna. <laughs> Do you remember what it was like being in the womb of your mother? Do you remember whether you were thinking of Krishna or not while you were within her womb? Ah, oh, forgetfulness. <laughs> so you make sure that in your house, there's always talking about Krishna, okay? You let me know if, if, there's, if that's not going on. You let me know, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, looks like Krishnananda. Um, Hare Krishna Gurudev, thank you very much for the questions and answers. You made a very nice point about as devotees, we should be moderate, which I can appreciate. My question then is Hi. when we read. Hi, our, right? Yeah. <laughs> When we read Prabhupada's books and we really study them deeply, we see that Prabhupada would often say some very radical things. And so our founder Acharya has at times a mood of very much sort of radicalism. So how do we balance this radical precept of the uh, founder Acharya with the need to be moderate as devotees? Uh, give me an example. Uh, okay. This is from the first canto, um, 17th chapter, text 28. Prabhupada says, the administrators cannot prevent corrupt activities by allowing wine shops. They must at once close all shops of intoxicating drugs and wine and force punishment even by death for those who indulge in habits of intoxication of all description. So that, that's just an example how sometimes Prabhupada would say some very heavy or radical things so how to reconcile that you be moderate in your application <laughs> you get the idea you get the point he's trying to make uh, that if you if governments are really serious about stopping substance abuse, this is what they should do. But we know that they're not so serious. In fact, the government leaders themselves are the worst substance abusers. <laughs> so you are moderate in your, in any application, but he's giving you what is the ideal response. If you truly want to get rid of substance abuse addiction, Here's what you do. <laughs> of course, in places like Singapore or Malaysia, if you're caught dealing drugs, you're hanged. Now, other nations consider that this law is barbaric. <laughs> but the Singaporeans and Malaysians say, uh, guess what? We don't have the drug problem that you guys have. <laughs> We're serious about no drugs. There was one American who went to Singapore and he put up some graffiti at night and he was caught and punished with he got the punishment in court of getting like 40 lashes. <laughs> and the lashes, the whipping was known to make you make your skin, your buttocks break out in painful welts just on the first lash. And he was sentenced to get 40. So the American government was outraged. How can you do this to one of our citizens? This is abusive. Even the president of the USA got involved. <laughs> but the Singaporean said, hey, uh, we have our laws and he shouldn't be putting up graffiti. 
And that's the way the law is. And therefore we don't have a graffiti problem here. You look in New Zealand, I've seen over the past 25 years since I first came, the graffiti goes up everywhere, disfiguring in such a horrible way. But you don't see that in Singapore because everyone knows uh, these are the laws. There are severe penalties for littering. Now you might say, well, what's wrong with a little bit of littering here and there? <laughs> so Prabhupada is pointing out that if you're serious about dealing with substance abuse, this is what a government does. But governments aren't serious because they are the ones who are drinking the most. So moderate in application. Go deeper than just mm, marching them off to war based on such directives. His books are for not just the present moment, but for the future also. And you may not know what the future is. I see under the Zoom name of Madhava Mohani, there's a hand up. Hey, Krishna Gurude. How can we overcome aversion? What do you mean by aversion? First of all, give me an example. Is it in music? You're a musical composer, so you're averse to some other music, or what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, in associating with devotees, because we all have. Ah, oh, now you're getting to the core of the matter. Like there's some devotees you like and some you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> now, looking at all the devotees that are surrounding you and I like them all. <laughs> they all look like heavenly angels. I don't know if they behave like that all the time, but that's how they look to me. <laughs> what do you think? I do think they're all angels. Definitely. They're all angels, but they have their moments. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, and I also have mine. Indeed. So as I often point out, to benefit from associating with devotees, you have to also be tolerant. So how do you be more tolerant? How to be more tolerant? Remember, you would want devotees to be tolerant with you, right? So give them that same tolerance back in return because you want to benefit from their association even though sometimes there may be arguments disagreements someone's having a bad day in a bad mood this goes on in any kind of human arrangement family life societies neighborhood get used to it This is the world of variety, and variety can often mean another name for disagreement. <laughs> but you should appreciate the value of associating with devotees in spite of inconveniences. And I agree, sometimes it's inconvenient. Older devotees also have their disagreements. But you learn how to process it, how to deal with it. That's important. So you can go on reaping the benefits of devotee association. Okay? So I see Ishan. You have a question? Your, your hand is up. Uh -huh. Want to ask Ishan? <laughs> okay. Ishan has the question of how can you see a soul in the material world?
you can't unless Krishna makes it visible to you as he did with Agasura. Do you know the Agasura Leela, Ishan? Oh, that's me. He said, no. Ah, when Agasura left his body, his serpent body, Krishna made it so that his departed soul was visible, especially to the demigods. I don't know who else could see it, but the demigods saw it. And the demigods saw the spirit soul hovering in the sky and then entering the body of Krishna. Actually, the spirit soul entered into the Brahman, the effulgence of Krishna. And from there went to Vaikuntha. But the point is that with material vision, you can't see the spirit soul. Have you seen the wind, Ishan? Say it a bit louder. No, I've not seen the wind, but I've felt uh, the wind. He, he said uh, he, he hasn't seen the wind, but he's felt the wind. But he what the wind? But what, what's has that? Felt, has felt the wind. Okay, so you can't see the spirit soul, but you can understand its existence by its symptoms, its effects. Okay. Okay. But I still don't understand. But what? Huh? But I still don't understand. Your vision is limited. Can you remember life in the womb of Vishnu Maya? No. Okay. So how smart are you then? How smart is anyone? <laughs> so many things you can't see. Can you remember your past life? No. Okay. Does that mean you never had a past life? Definitely. So you think about that. <laughs> you're speaking because you're conscious. Have you seen consciousness? You can discuss that with your father. He deals with this issue all the time. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So I think we've reached the end of the questions. I didn't get any doomsday questions. What's going on? Hey, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> all right. I thank you all for your association. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.